Does this work? Okay. All right. As I was saying, went to this website to see about the new movie 42 that's coming out this week, I guess. That would be, by the way, a good way for me to earn some extra money. Um, like get some places to like sponsor me. So like I could say, coming in theaters near you this week. And then I could, you know, pitch a movie or, or you know, I could like have a Gatorade here and ooh, refreshing, you know, and all that. You know, times are tough. You know, times are tough. We got <laughs> we to gotta do what we can, right? At any, <laughs> at any rate, I went and looked at this website, and this website is a really great looking website. I mean, the navigation is good, and so on. The only problem is you can't read a good portion of the text. All right? And I started thinking, it's like, wow, you know, this is Warner Brothers that did this. You know, they got a few bucks. They can hire someone that's good, and they probably did hire someone that's good. What's the problem here? Why isn't this working? Then I realized it all relates to screen size. In other words, when I was viewing it upstairs in my office, I had um, a screen size approximately this big, where part of it was covered by Harrison Ford's jacket. Whereas my guess is the developer, the graphic designer, being a superstar graphic designer with his giant old Mac probably has some giant big screen monitor which this looks perfect in. So I'll go in and let's see if I can change Oh, out of range. Let's see if I can change this to a higher uh, screen resolution. We can see it's coming to be a little bit better at, at the bigger screen resolution. And probably if we went bigger still, you know, it would be able to see it. So why do I show you this? Well, first of all, it's fun to, to, to see that even professionals don't get everything right all the time. And even professionals make the so-called rookie mistakes. All right? And so take that as a comfort. And take that as a reminder that when you're viewing your page, view it under as many possible conditions as you can. View it on small screens. View it on bigger screens and work so that it at least looks reasonably good uh, across a variety of platforms. How could he have fixed that? How could he have fixed that? That's a good question. We're, Even if you put white, white. Right. I mean, you still have the same problem. Right? You'd lose in the cloud. Okay. Um, yeah, right, right, exactly. The question is, I pointed out this web page, and I won't go through all the gyrations, but this, some, a lot of this text is very difficult to read because it's dark text against his dark jacket. All right? On a bigger screen resolution, the dark text floats over and you can read it up against that. So the person didn't really spend sufficient time testing this in a variety of platforms is the conclusion that I have come to. The question is, is how to fix it? How would you fix this? How could you fix this? Okay. Okay. How would that fix this, though? Well, you said that it was put on a on a big screen. Right. Right. On a on a giant screen, this would look good. Oh. So, like, even on this desktop, again, that text isn't readable. Even on a normal size desktop. All right. Right. That would be one way to do this, is would be to have a background on here that was see-through. So you could still see the picture underneath it. Because obviously, you know, a movie, the background image, and, and showing, setting the scene of the movie with the background image is probably more important than it would be in just your average run-of-the-mill website. So they probably want that image there. All right. So. Putting uh, a, a semi-transparent background 
underneath there, uh, underneath that would probably help it a lot. What's another way? Yes. You could have edited the image one way or another. That would be one way. For example, let's see, what is that in the background? Is, is, that, a, is that the stadium in the background? Well, that's kind of important. You might want that in there. You could fade the image, make it look more like a watermark. You could possibly crop the image out. You could, you could, you could somehow edit the image to make this work. Yes? Set the opacity of the image, even. Yeah, so that, that, that the image, again, is, is sort of faded. Yeah, so it looks more like a watermark kind of thing as opposed to that. Another way that we could fix this. That's a good thought, but what's wrong with that is depending on the specific page that you're on and depending on how big the screen is, you're going to get overlap at different places. So if you, if you were even able to do that, that might work for like one particular uh, uh, screen resolution, but like anything else, you'd be back to, the, to square one on it. So yeah, it's a good thought, but that wouldn't be possible. Well, this isn't the home page. No, this is, this is uh, I went to a movie about this film. Okay. So cast, you get the same thing on the cast. So you're, they're using fonts on, on everything, really. See how that's coming soon? That would be good. Um, yeah, yeah that, look, that look, yeah, right. That looked good because there's, there's nothing there. <laughs> Just two words. <laughs> What's another way we could fix this? I'm going to wait until we get one more way if I have to sit here all day. Yes? I don't know if this is just an idea, but could, could you break it up in little paragraphs and kind of have them above the sky and above the sky and above the sky and above the sky and above the sky? Could you rearrange the text so that it hit that? Mm, maybe. Um, again, the difficulty that you'd run in there. I, I think you're on the right track, but the difficulty that you'd run in there is that could work for a screen resolution and not another. Uh, maybe. So, for example, if we look at this, as we make the screen bigger and smaller, it's a fixed width. Yeah. Right. So maybe, so maybe we adjust the container also, or, or not the container, but the text also, so it gets smaller as that corresponding gets smaller. That's that would be another good way. Yes. Yeah, I, I guess that would be some form of editing the background image or changing the background. But yeah, you, that, that's another variation on that theme. The last theme I would have is don't make this, uh, make a fixed layout as opposed to a, um, a, a floating layout. The problem is, is that this guy's, the image floats. Yeah, the image is, is based on a relative size. If we made that image fixed, let's say, sketch this. If we made this image fixed so that the two guys were here and the dark area was here and it didn't float. Okay. <laughs> it's simple though, right? That's the official web page for John Cage's uh, 433 composition. All right. Um, okay, so, so you're saying fix the, fix, fix the image and then fix the font so it overlays over, uh, uh, over a portion of the screen 
that you know is going to be readable on. Have a separate mobile page. So, the bigger point is it's good, it's good to hear the brainstorming and hear the thought processes of how to fix it. I think we covered just about all the reasonable ways that, that I would go and fix that. But my bigger point is the frustrations that you go through are the frustrations that web developers go through. That's the tough part of it, is get things that work across a variety of platforms. You know, anyone can make a web page that looks good on their monitor. That was always our joke as software developers uh, and, and then later on as web developers, is would, you know, would say it worked on our machine. You know, of course it worked on our machine because we configured it exactly the way we wanted to and for web pages we designed it to look good on all, whatever size monitor we had, whatever browser we used, blah, blah, blah. But that's not the point, right? Because not everyone in the world is going to come to your machine to look at the web page or to run the application. You need to take it and generalize it, make it work under a variety of, of circumstances. So if you're developing software, you need to know like how the machine needs to be configured to run that software. If you have like an installation routine or certain settings in, in some other software has to match. If you're talking about web pages, it has to work in other browsers, other platforms, other screen sizes. And that's really the challenge. And so you got to kind of take a step back and, and have this sort of baked in your thinking from the word go, right? Um, remember, and, and again, I think depending on the day, sometimes, some days I was very good at doing this, some days I probably wasn't so good at doing this. But do the testing all along. In other words, don't develop your website and then go and test this. Gee, I wonder what it looks like on an 800 by 600 monitor, all right? Ooh, it looks horrible. Or how does this look in Internet Explorer or whatever. Fill in your blank there. So if you test that all the way along, then you're just, you know, incrementally testing the most recent thing you've changed. You're not like testing a whole giant block of stuff. You, know, you can do a little bit of work, do some testing, resolve the issues. Do a little bit more work, a little more testing, resolve the issues, and so on. But yeah, I was surprised to see how even otherwise in a very nice website, just, you know, that's kind of a rookie mistake. To, to do that, you know, to, to that would be a possibility that, that this is based on some sort of template that maybe they use for a lot of their movies. Maybe this wasn't custom and maybe they didn't think on how the image would work against that. As possible. Exactly. Exactly. That's why it's like, you look at this, this isn't the work of a hack, right? This is work of someone that, that got a little lazy and, and, and didn't test things all the way through. All right. You know, so it's kind of like if you see, uh, you know, if you're an aspiring basketball player and you see LeBron miss a free throw or a golfer and Tiger Woods miss a putt, you know, it's good to know that even the best in the world are human. All right. So as students, yes. They, why would it be there then? Yeah, if the text isn't important, why would they put it there? There's an awful lot of non-important text. Um. Yeah. Uh, the. the, the <laughs> The question is, would no one read it? Well, first of all, first of all, uh, obviously, you wouldn't say no one would read it, because that was the first thing I did, is went to try to read this. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So the, the point is, if it's not important, then don't put it there. Like, don't, you know, don't say, well, all right, I'm going to create 50 pages of text on it, but since no one's going to read them, I will use wingdings as my font, right? You know, because, yeah, text isn't very important and no one reads these days anyhow, you know. If that was truly the case, then, then why bother? And get rid of 50 pages, right? Unless this guy gets paid by the page or something and had to crank out a few extra pages. I don't know. Just, just joking about that. Yes. 
I think the developer wanted this to look good, and I think the developer is probably a ace graphic designer. If you ever seen those people's monitors, they're gigantic. They're like big screen TVs. And they typically have two monitors, in fact. One in which they're viewing their end result of their work and one where they have their tools going on. So if they're running some sort of editor, it's like in this little screen here and they're checking their music and they're playing really cool music, you know, uh, that, that I only, that, that made by some band that's name sounds made up or whatever. And uh, then in the, in the, the big monitor, they're showing their web page. All right. And, and so my guess would be A, the interest was making it look good, which if you think about it for a movie, that is important. So that aspect of it is good. But they, 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 they just like didn't dot the I's and cross the T's, I guess, is what I'm saying here. Somebody was missing a launch meeting. Schedules conflicted. Somebody didn't respond. <laughs> well, we could speculate all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of things. I've joked sometimes that, like, you know, due to budget constraints, we're going to start using smaller fonts on our website. You know, maybe it was something like that. I don't know. All right. I am interested how this movie is. I can't wait to see some reviews of it because this could be good. And Harrison Ford usually, I'm trying to think of a bad Harrison Ford movie, and I really can't think of any. He's probably been in some, but I'm trying to think of a bad. Oh, he has? Yeah. But it's Indiana Jones. You get a pass on that. <laughs> and, 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 and that one we're pinning on Shia LaBeouf, not Harrison Ford. So <laughs> we'll pin it on him. So yeah, he gets, he gets a, he, he's Indiana Jones, man. He gets a pass on that one. All right. <laughs> Anyhow. Anyhow, our topic today is on accessibility. All right. And accessibility is a topic that a lot of people don't really understand. And when I say a lot of people, I'm not talking about like a lot of like regular folks. I'm talking about a lot of web developers. A lot of web developers really don't understand accessibility. All right. Accessibility really is sort of an extension of what we've been talking about all along insofar as you don't know, you know, who slash what is on the other end making a request for a web page that you've designed. All right. You know, this is an example in a way of the designer not realizing that the person making the request didn't have a giant screen or not thinking about it and therefore their text is hard to read. All right. While cross, well, well typically if we're talking about those sorts of issues, those usually are called like cross browser or cross platform issues. All right or client related issues or whatever. When we talk about accessibility, we're talking about issues that relate to the individual that's using the machine. All right. In other words, person has a different set of abilities or disabilities which may compromise their ability to get the information off of the web page. All right. Let's start out by thinking um, what are some of the different disabilities that could impact the way that someone accessed the information on a web page? Yeah. Yeah. Very, you know, the very first one, the one that, in fact, this is, this is the one that like most people think of when you talk about accessibility issues. And, you know, it certainly is, is one, and it's certainly an important one. But most or many web developers sort of perceive this as the only issue, and that is people that are blind. Especially when you consider that if we extend this to talk about general vision problems, we have a whole gamut of things. Simply, you know, poor vision. I'm not blind, but I have poor vision, right? So some websites are hard for me to read. Colorblind, all right? These are things that could potentially be a problem in accessing a website. You know, push the red link for 
you know, free cell phone for life. Click the blue one to delete your Facebook page or something like that. You know, which one do you click? I don't know. Right? You can't tell the difference if you're colorblind. Even with colorblindness, there are kinds of colorblindness. In other words, a colorblind person doesn't see the world in black and white. A colorblind person, necessarily, a colorblind person uh, may just not be able to distinguish two specific colors, like red-green is a common uh, combination, that, you, that, that red and green just sort of look the same, sort of a murky sort of color. Is anyone in here colorblind? All right. Never had a, 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 I never had a student that, that, that said they were colorblind when I asked that. So, um, interesting. What's another disability that would affect your ability to access content on a website? Hearing. Obviously, if someone is deaf, they can't hear any audio content. Or they might not be able to hear the audio accompanying some video content. All right. Are there lesser... How, how do I want to say this? Are there lesser degrees of hearing issues that maybe aren't quite deafness, but also could impact someone? All right. So, particular pitches. Just in general, hard of hearing. And is there another circumstance that may not have anything to do with the person's ears where audio content could be problematic? In other words, you can have someone with 20-20 hearing if that's such a thing. The device that you're on. Yeah. Okay. That that's a possibility, the device. That that, that that's one one instance of it, absolutely. Anything else? Are there speak oh go ahead. Okay, it could could be that could be the, the 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 that their configuration isn't correct. I'm thinking of a of, of a case that's near and dear to all of our hearts. All right, are there speakers in the computers in the computer labs here? No. Well, why not? Well, could you imagine being in a room with 30 people all tuned to their favorite online radio stations, blasting away? You wouldn't be able to hear anything. All right. Or computers in a library. I would doubt that they have speakers installed for a similar reason. So in sort of a loud environment or a public environment, for example, it might be, might be difficult to hear, you know, and therefore may not have speakers or it might just be difficult to hear. All right. I make this point because this is going to be a common theme as we talk about accessibility, all right? As we talk about accessibility issues, there are sort of the, the dramatic cases of people with severe disabilities that have a gigantic impact on how they access information on the web. You know, the web is a visual media, right? So if you don't have vision, you're going to be impacted in a big way, all right? Hearing may not be quite as, as big of an obstacle because a lot of web pages don't have audio, but some do. All right? And that's going to constitute a big obstacle in you accessing material on the web. So, yeah, there's a sort of like, how do I want to say it? Sort of these, these very severe disabilities that people can have that can uh, uh, impact their ability to access the page. There's also going to be sort of a tier of people that don't necessarily have that disability, but they're impacted in lesser ways. 
for example, the person with bad eyesight compared to someone that's totally blind, right? person with bad eyesight might have a hard time reading smaller fonts. They're not blind, they just can't read the tiny fonts, all right? Someone that's colorblind isn't blind, but may have trouble reading stuff if the color combination is goofy or whatever, all right? So you have the severe disabilities, you have sort of that less severe cases, then you have situations that are not necessarily disabilities at all, but where even people without disabilities are impacted for some reason or another. So for example, a student in an open lab um, isn't deaf, isn't necessarily hard of hearing, but audio content will be problematic for them. All right? So we'll notice this. The reason I bring this up is because, again, in most discussions about accessibility, people, first of all, only think about people that are blind. All right? And they're liable to say, you know, well, you know, what can we do for people that are blind? That only represents X percent of the population. It's going to cost us enormous expense to make our site accessible. So, you know, we're not necessarily going to pay attention to it. And that's an attitude that I like to try to correct. I think there is three sort of good arguments for paying attention to the accessibility of your site. And along with those three arguments, I think there is, um, how do I want to say, um, sort of another reason beyond that. The three arguments to make your site accessible, first of all, would be to say that it's the right thing to do, right? You're making a website, you want to be as inclusive as possible, right? You don't want to deny someone the right to visit your website and get your content just because they're blind or deaf or have any of these other disabilities. So that's sort of the right thing to do, all right? And I would say that, you know, that should be enough to motivate you, you know, not to preach morality here, but it makes sense, right? You're going to all this effort to make a website. You want the maximum audience that you can get, all right? If that doesn't appeal to you, there is the potential appeal that you could be losing customers, all right? If you think about it, someone that is blind is apt to have a hard time getting out and shopping. So... Online shopping might be a great way for them to do some shopping online without having to actually, you know, go somewhere and shop. So you have, if your site is inaccessible, you have, you have the, run the potential of losing some business. So that's not necessarily the moral appeal. That's a, appealing to the, the, to the pocketbook. All right? And then sort of the third layer is that you might get sued if your site is inaccessible. All right? Um... The law isn't necessarily 100% clear, and I am, am not going to speak, uh, you know, to that. But there have been companies that are uh, have been sued, and I include one of the links uh, in the resources about Target being sued because some of their site was inaccessible for people that uh, were blind. All right? So that's sort of the three arguments. The moral argument is the right thing to do. The economic argument... Why turn away dollars from anyone? And finally, the legalistic argument, um, protect yourself against lawsuit. There's a third, or, or a fourth rather, consideration, and that is to a large degree, guidelines for accessible websites are just plain good web design to begin with. All right? And we'll talk more about that as we go forward. There's a notion of universal design, all right? And a lot of people prefer to speak of universal design instead of accessible design. Accessible design makes it sound like we're developing our websites or even our physical buildings for those people that have disabilities. When in reality, we're building them for everyone, all right? And in physical terms, there are some things that may be put in to the design of a building that were put there to benefit people that have disabilities, but could also benefit other people as well. 
Can anyone think of anything on campus, anything on the physical campus, let's forget about websites, I know it's hard, but let's forget about websites for a minute, and think of the physical campus, or really any building. Can you think of something that may have been put there for people with disabilities, but actually helps other people under other conditions? Yes. Walkways? Which? The ones that are enclosed? The enclosed walkways. All right. Um, how would how, you, you were in a wheelchair? Okay. Okay. It would make it easier for people in a wheelchair to navigate between the, the, the walkways of, of there. That's true. And how does that help people that are not? Yeah, if if it's if there's ten feet of snow outside, you don't have to worry about that. Any other examples? The elevator. The elevator. All right. If you're in a wheelchair, obviously you can't go up steps. All right, so it would help someone that was uh, in a wheelchair. How else would that help? Got a pile of books. Got a, pile of books. a broken leg. You are not feeling so well that day. Any number of reasons. All right. The ramps out there, wheelchair ramps, you know. If you notice, like, where there's steps that go down, there's also a ramp. You can take a wheelchair down. Well, I've seen people pushing library carts that go over there, or carts for catering that go over those things, or people um, that have a ton of books with those giant suitcases of books that are on wheels. They drag those around behind them. Uh, the, the, the physical plant guys sometimes have these little vehicles that they drive around like to do yard work or whatever. May even be one out there now. Okay, there you go. There you go. Wow, good timing, yeah. Um, so again, we, we recognize that in, in real world things and we'll see cases where taking the broader view, we see that this isn't strictly an accessibility issue, but in effect we're killing two birds with one stone. We're, we're addressing accessibility issues, but we're also helping everyone. So. The concept is that of universal design. Now to be sure, there are some accessibility issues that really are not likely to help anyone that is not suffering from that disability. For example, there's, there's braille room numbers out there. All right? I don't know, did anyone notice that there's braille room numbers out there? I think there are. Let me go out and check. Yep, there are. I was going to say, I've been saying that for the, for the 11 years I've been teaching here. It would be funny if someone went out and said, no, there aren't Braille. But no, there are. There are Braille room numbers out there. Now, a good portion of you didn't even notice that. And if you did notice that, would it particularly bother you or get in your way or make it harder for you to, to go about and get in a room? No, of course not. So, with the notion of universal design is that by designing for people with disabilities, we're going to accommodate some of their unique needs, but we're also going to accommodate the needs of people that don't have those disabilities, especially under certain circumstances. So again, people that have milder forms of those disabilities, or people like in a, a noisy lab that can't listen to an audio clip, people that are um, in a certain situation. All right. Um, now, what are some other disabilities? We talked about uh, vision related and hearing related. What's another kind of disability? Okay. Yeah, motor, motor controls issues. All right. And it was mentioned someone with a stroke. All right. There are any number of issues that would be similar to that. Varying levels of severity. All right. Um, I had a student that was confined to a wheelchair and had some use of their arms, but not like the fine control of their arms. All right. That would be similar to someone having a stroke. Um, 
People with certain neurological issues like Parkinson's where their hands shake a little bit. That would be an example uh, also. Sort of on the mild end of the extreme, and I don't mean to discount this particular issue, but people with carpal tunnel, all right, or repetitive stress injury, you know. Um, that would be another case of that. All these things are the way that are affecting the movement of the mouse especially. So stroke, um, Parkinson's or other neurological or a repetitive, repetitive stress injury. Another kind of disability that might be relevant. Okay. How is that relevant? Right. Yeah, especially certain kinds of flashing lights, kinds of flashing animation can, can trigger seizures. All right. That's one. Any others? I'd say there's probably one big group that we haven't talked about. Um, yeah, that is, that is definitely true. Uh, the statement was made if you're designing a site for children. Um, that is true. I mean, that gets into the whole know your audience, know your audience's goals, and, and know, you know, know what your audience is like, you know, the rule of communicating. I wouldn't classify that as an accessibility issue, but that definitely would be a consideration. There's a whole range of cognitive issues. ADHD and dyslexia are two that spring to mind. All right. That could affect your ability to access a page. How could ADHD affect your ability to access a web page? Page is really, really cluttered. All right. Okay. 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 A clutter, a cluttered site uh, could be problematic for that. Um, now, again, remember that the good news in this scenario is that. As I said before, a lot of the things we're going to do in the name of accessibility really echo good web design principles. All right? So the statement was made for someone with ADHD, too much clutter is a bad thing because there's a potential to distract them. So strip it down to the essentials and focus on the stuff that is important. Since day one in this class, I think I have said that anything you put on your page has the potential to distract people from the stuff that's really important, right? So, in other words, you know, when we talk about goals, why not try to address every single goal that your user might ever have? Well, because to do that, you might make your site very, very complicated and you might provide tons of information but make it very difficult for people to get to the stuff that they really want. A classic example of this, this isn't a web case, but a classic example of this for me anyhow, for your mileage may vary as they say, is with Microsoft Word. You can do a bazillion things in it, of which I probably have done three in my life. I've probably like changed the font, put a page break in, and maybe put a footnote. I don't know. That's like the only thing that I've ever done in Microsoft Word. But you can do a trillion things, right? You can do things that, that, you know, 
I should probably turn the microphone off at this point, but I teach this sometimes, all right? And there's stuff in there that's like, what? You could do that, really? And that makes it tough to do the five or six things that everyone always wants to do. Funny thing about software, and again, I, 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 I'm, I'm putting uh, a parallel between software and web pages here, is not every piece of content or not every feature within an application is equal. Yet software developers see it as equal. All right, some software developers. Why? Well, because it's a task for them to do. Um, a lot of software developers like really complicated things, right? And therefore, if 10 features are good, 100 features will be great. They have that sort of mentality. But that's not the way most of us think, and that's not the way people think when they access the web. So to the point of for ADHD, the statement was, get rid of clutter. Make the page simple. Make the page really focused on the message that you're trying to get. That's exactly the same thing I would say for developing pages for people that don't have ADHD. So in that regard, at least along, at least in this particular situation, the goals of accessibility and the goals of just good design line up really well. All right? You know, taste great, less filling. You know, do it for accessibility. Do it because it's a good web design principle. Hey, either way you get to the same goal. All right. There's sort of two, two fundamental principles about universal design. And I'll state them, and then I'll talk a bit about them, and then we'll want to apply them to the different disabilities. And again, I'm not sure how far we'll get today, but, but we'll see. And the two fundamental principles are multiple presentation and simplicity. Now, at first glance, you might say that these two things sort of contradict each other. If not contradict each other, work against each other. Multiple presentation would be a case of, for example, having an audio clip and also having a text transcript of the speech. That would be multiple presentation. In other words, you have the same piece of content. You have someone's speech that you have an audio clip of, and then you have the text of it. You might say, well, that's having two things. That's not very simple. That's making it more complicated. Here's kind of the thought of how it goes. In some respects, yeah, these two do, they, they pull you in different directions. All right? But balancing between sort of two opposing forces, in my mind anyhow, is what design is all about. All right? Making something functional yet making it simple. That's pulling in two different forces because I could add stuff to make it more functional, but that's going to make it more complicated and less simple. All right? Having too little content on the page isn't a good thing. Having too much content on the page isn't a good thing either. So too simple of content on a web page is bad. Too complicated content on a web page is bad. You've got to find that sweet spot right in the middle. Well, multiple presentations, yeah. That's adding several ways to represent the same content. All right. So in that respect, you're adding content. You're making it more complicated. And that pulls you possibly in a different direction than the, the, the search for simplicity. All right? And yes, you do have to balance that. A few thoughts on this. All right? First of all, multiple presentation does not mean that we are going to present content in every single way we could possibly think of doing it. All right? In other words, we're not going to have an audio clip, a video clip, text, 
an animation of someone doing the speech, you know, and all those different things. It's about picking and choosing where you're going to make an impact. All right? And some of them are no-brainers, right? For example, if you have audio content, you should have some text version of that so people that can't hear can see. Now, what form does that take? It could be a transcript. It could be closed captions in the case of, like, a video. But that's one that, yeah, that's, yeah, that makes things a little more complicated, but it's something that's absolutely required for people that can't hear. It is probably beneficial for people that don't have great hearing. In other words, there's times when I have a hard time hearing uh, the TV or the computer or whatever. All right. And finally, that's good for people that aren't in a position to listen, like maybe you in lab. You know how many times I've been in lab going to CNN site, all right, and I'll look at a story and they only have it in video form. All right. Now, there may be reasons they do that because they want you to see the advertisement or whatever. But from an accessibility perspective, that's horrible. All right? I don't know if those have closed caption, but I want to see the story and I essentially can't because I don't want that blurring the speakers in lab. Another reason is, even as an able-bodied uh, uh, user, I can probably scan through and read a news story a lot quicker than I could listen to a three-minute news report. So maybe if, I, if there was a transcript of it, I could scan through it and decide is this worth watching the news report for or not. So when we talk about multiple presentation, we're talking about adding things not just for the sake of adding them, but presenting the, things, uh, for presenting the same material two different ways so that, first of all, people with disabilities can benefit and, and get that content. And secondly, other people under other circumstances then have the option. You know, we've all heard of people, some people being visual learners and some people being audio learners and so on. By giving variations in that, we give the ability for someone to, to choose what works best for their particular style and their particular um, abilities. What can we do multiple presentation-wise for people that can't see? Right. Right. There's an alt attribute on the image. There's actually a full, dis there, there's also another attribute that I think is called the description attribute where you can actually put a link to a text description of that. All right. So the alt attribute on images is important. All right. It is important, although for some people, that's all they think of when they think of accessibility. Is oh, I got alt attributes, so my site must be accessible. It's like, well, no, that's a good step in the right direction, but that isn't the whole thing, you know. So the alt attributes would be a good one. Possibly having an audio clip along with text so it can be read, would be another one. How do people even access the web with, uh, th that are blind? A screen reader. It goes through and reads the screen to them. Now, there's things that you can do layout-wise to make the screen reader's job easier, and that sort of falls under the area of simplicity. So we'll, we won't talk about that right now. What about someone that's colorblind? How could multiple presentation help someone that is colorblind? Okay, you, you wouldn't necessarily design a second site with different colors that they could choose, but you, would give you could give people options about what the color theme is. You know, sometimes it's all about like skinning your site, so you can put a skin on it. In Angel, for example, you can change your theme. Um, another one, um, here's a, a site that is actually a school for the blind. And so as you can imagine, they're very sensitive to 
accessibility issues, but you can go and you can choose by color. All right. So if you weren't blind, but you were colorblind, or maybe you had very poor vision, you could pick the color scheme that worked best for you. And you could also uh, set um, text sizes. So yeah, one way that you could help people who are colorblind is allow some sort of customization of that. Now, how do you do that? Well, we've learned about applying CSS to different pages. What we just have to do is find out a way that we can allow the user to choose which, which CSS file. That, that's, again, beyond the scope of this course. But we've put ourselves in the right position for it. And to do it really isn't that hard. Uh, and we might even look at that when we talk about JavaScript towards the end of the semester. What's another way we can help someone that's colorblind that deals with multiple presentations? All right. Um, actually, we can't make general statements because there's different sorts of colorblindness. There is a green-blue colorblindness, but there also is a, a like a red-green colorblindness. So yeah, you definitely want to you definitely want to choose contrasting colors. All right, and avoid problematic color combinations. The other thing I'm thinking for someone that's colorblind is you don't you use more than color to indicate something is special. So for example, let's say I had a section of my article that was very, very, very important. All right? And I wanted to make it red so that it stands out. Because right, you know, in our society, red kind of means, oh, get your attention, it's something important. All right, or maybe even some sort of warning. Well, okay, that will work for people that are not colorblind, but for people that can't distinguish red, you might do something like put it also in a bigger font or put it in italics or make it bold. So that's another form of multiple presentation. So I want to indicate that this text is special, that it's important or whatever. So one way I could do it is by color. Well, for people that don't get that, make it italic, make it bold, make it a different font, make it a bigger font. All right? Put a border around it. There's any number of things that we can do visually as a second way to show people that this is important. So if they can't detect the color, they can see the second. Now, the person that isn't colorblind, they see both of those. And they know it's important, right? They know it's important based on two visual cues. Uh, doesn't really affect their experience, right? It really stands out for them. They really will be sure not to miss it. Whereas someone that is colorblind at least gets the other visual cue. What we'll do next time is we'll talk more about some of these guidelines and all that and simplicity. And uh, I'll point out some of the resources that I have available on ANGEL uh, about this. All right. We'll see you in lab.